here's the record button. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're very glad you're here. It's good to see your bright and shining avatars <laughs> to start off our day. Um, maybe one of these days we'll be back in person fully post pandemic. I have folks coming in. I just want to welcome you to the second day of the 11th annual Oregon Active Transportation Summit hosted by the Street Trust. We're very grateful that you're here. We're very grateful to the staff uh, and our volunteers who are pulling this together for us today and to our sponsors. I hope you'll visit the sponsors panel um, in the Zoom conference center, aka the lobby, uh, where you can see all of our generous, generous sponsors who are making this exchange of knowledge and ideas. Uh, an innovation possible for us. I did wanna highlight a few things. We are having a few in-person events today and Maddie will give you some more detailed information about that at the end of this morning plenary, but there is still room for people to participate in the Afro Village site visit. I'm told there are some surprising uh, libations and refreshments available at that one, but you didn't hear that from me. And then the Greenways bike tour is also going to be really fun this afternoon, and both of those things are happening, rain or shine. Uh, if you do want to participate, though, you probably should uh, sign up to hold your spot because space is limited. And um, I just wanted to say a few words about the Street Trust as well. Yesterday, we had such an informative, uh, inspiring time thinking about the future of transportation in our region. And I wanted to stress to you how important the advocacy work that the Street Trust does is in that, in that um, transportation future. Because one of the things that we're doing as we have reorganized in the past year on both our C3 side and our C4 political action committee is thinking about regional capacity building to realize the gains that many of our morning speakers yesterday talked about. So what does it mean to organize greater numbers of people all around this region for better outcomes? We heard from our community panel in particular that the voices of people who use our transportation system, especially our public transit system, are so key and making sure that those voices are represented in policy making is a huge priority for us right now. So I hope that you will continue to support the Street Trust um, day to day by renewing your membership. It's pretty critical. You can go to thestreettrust.org and um, update your membership so that we can count you among our supporters when we go forward with uh, policy uh, recommendations and advocacy. And also to visit the Our Streets campaign. We were just the recipient of a generous gift from the Bullet Family Foundation uh, to support this regional mobility project, which is the building out of the Our Streets community scorecard. And we'll be building out a data visualization tool that communities all around our region can tap into to help them advocate for better transportation outcomes where they live. And there is a community mobilization uh, component to that. So we're very grateful to the Bullet Foundation for supporting that work. And we hope that you will support us by learning more about it at thestreettrust.org slash our streets. Without further ado, I wanna introduce you to Maria Sippen. She's gonna to talk to you about redistributing power, colon committees, and thank you to everyone for being here in attendance. And we look forward to hearing from you, Maria. And thank you for pulling together this amazing presentation. Thank you. This is an amazing room to be in today. I'm honored to be presenting alongside some awesome people like Danny Cage, Vivian Satterfield, and LP Pham, people who have been working in the community to continue to agitate, advocate, and push forward some critical uh, transportation issues in their neighborhoods in the region and across the state. I think this topic is pertinent now more than ever because we are facing a climate crisis we're facing lots of transportation injustices that have been well documented and just continue to persist. We're talking about health inequities in transportation a lot more explicitly and the ways that we operate um, to address those inequities. Lots of decisions happen behind closed doors. Lots of them happen in public. We have committees, commissions, and all types of planning teams and departments that are at the helm of addressing lots of these issues that we're facing today in transportation. 
many of us in this room are part of forming committees and commissions that have a lot of power over decisions and outcomes. A lot of us have joined committees and commissions as token members to satisfy checkboxes or to change the status quo. But not, not all kinds of change happens overnight and not everything can happen in the hands of committees, but we do know there's so much potential for transforming power within these spaces, which is why we're talking about it. We wanna talk about the things that are working well and the things that aren't, and perhaps um, continue to influence some of you to do the good work you're doing or to change up things that are just causing a lot more harm. Um, and here's my Slido poll that I've got for us to help us think through some of the committees that you might be familiar with and some that come to mind in Oregon specifically with transportation interest or influence. So feel free to chime in there and think about any questions that you may have. Type it into Slido, type it into the chat, and we'll do our best to get through them with our short session. I'm seeing the Public Transportation Advisory Committee, Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee. Lots of advisory type committees. There's steering committees as well, if you can think of some of those. We'll keep this list in mind because we know in Oregon, we don't have a shortage of committees. <laughs> There's a committee for everything, um, but it is frustrating from time to time being recruited to committees or having to form them as part of our jobs, knowing that so many decisions might have already been made before things go to committees or that we know that committees are just a, a figure or some symbolic assembly of people that they might not have a whole lot of power in the end. But we want you to think through the committees you're familiar with, the ones that you feel like are, are doing great things and the ones that might continue to, to cause some kind of standstill or deliberate harm in, in this era of climate emergencies and racial inequities. Some of the things that inspired this talk and why we're bringing committees forward to you all today um, is something from my home state of California as part of the Mobility Justice Advocates Group that kicked off something several years ago. I was one of the co-founders of this Mobility Justice Lab in thinking through what can we do to push forward some priorities to the California Transportation Commission um, knowing that a lot of the decisions they make impact where funds go in the state. And it's still, it's still part of the work now, even years in. Um, the commission makeup has gotten a little bit better and the staffers they've had have gotten better, but there's still lots of gaps in, in who gets heard, um, what gets on agendas and where money gets distributed, especially for active transportation. Um, I'm going to plug in a book that I've been reading for, for my public health courses called The Political Determinants of Health. One of those political determinants um, has a lot to do with politics and power and who gets to move things forward in, in the legislative realm. And committees have, have a hand at that in some way, shape, or form. I'm also involved in Participatory Budgeting Oregon, where we've been trying to chip away at some of the barriers to participatory democracy and who gets to decide um, where resources go, who gets to decide how power is distributed. And lastly, power mapping. For those of you who are planners or people who develop plans, we know that power mapping is a critical exercise for those of us who are community organizers and people who want to change the status quo. You map um, all of the political or planning influencers and those who have support or no support for a particular topic, let's say bike infrastructure, and you, you get to strategize on how to move people along the spectrum and how to get to outcomes that you need. But power mapping seems taboo still. Um, I think government agencies don't want to talk about where their power sits on this map or on this grid. And they certainly don't want to shift their power um, on a certain issue because they're comfortable where they're at. 
Okay, I'll, I'll introduce LP, who will talk to you about their experiences working at a hyperlocal level in Portland and also at a regional level too. And some things they've come across as a young person um, being recruited to these types of committees and things that often get overlooked. So LP, you ready? Thanks for hosting this, Maria. And hi, everyone. My name is Lillian Pham, they, she pronouns, and I also go by LP in a lot of my community spaces. I graduated from Reed in 2020, and after that, I became a neighborhood organizer in East Portland, specifically the Jade District and Park Rose. Uh, I have, like Maria said, I have served on city level committees, nonprofit committees, academic committees as a 23 year old and now 24 year olds. I'm currently working at a neighborhood prosperity initiative called Historic Park Rose, where we serve 99 to 121st on Sandy Boulevard. And I specifically run a BIPOC youth program called Youth for Park Rose for Park Rose High School. Uh, through that program, I've worked with like ODOT and PBOT, specifically right now with PBOT on the Vision Zero uh, project and outreach in East Portland with youth. And from all these experiences and these various types of committees and also interactions with just government employees, uh, um, I've been a person who's been part of pilot committees and then also someone who's joined older established committees. Uh, I've created a list of questions. I'm on my phone, but I bet you can see it on the slides right now. Yes, great. <laughs> so I created this list of questions that I hope you ask yourself and your team before making your committee. So I'm just gonna read them off. So the first one, why do we need blank committee? Who would be impacted by blank committee's decisions and conversations? What would happen if we blank before making a committee? How do we measure our capacity to hold blank? What will, could labor distribution look like? What is compensation? money, benefits, and beyond. What does support look like for blank? What does your relational work and your transactional work look like? Can a member leave and still be a part of the work? Who, outside of an obvious power position, can, go, can blank go to if there's conflict? What are our values of capital T time? How do we hold ourselves accountable to blank plus capital T time? What is your container for institutional memory? What if the committee dot, dot, dot had an expiration date centered on the personal and professional development of the committee members could be publicly accessible? Had shifting members, for example, there's group one, group two, and they shift per every month, just experimenting with the types of formats. And then also, what if a committee didn't have to rely on meetings? Those are my questions, a little sneak peek of what I can give for now, but I hope that can help y'all uh, guide through this committee mess and committee features. <laughs> um, I'll Thank pass it on you. to Danny. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Danny Cage. Uh, just a little bit about me. I am a youth organizer in Portland, Oregon. My focuses are mainly on climate justice, racial justice, transportation uh, justice, uh, and education reform. Uh, I am a member of Sunrise PDX, a youth-led climate group in Portland. Uh, I work with participatory budgeting, Oregon, a great group which has challenged uh, my ideas and my mindsets on one, how do we form a committee, but two, also what does democracy really look like and how do we give uh, power to uh, people and individual communities. Um, and lastly, I am a district student representative for Grant High School here in uh, Portland Public Schools. And I am the student representative to the Portland Public School Board of Education Policy Committee. Um, and I kind of formed, uh, you know, when we talk about, so in Portland Public Schools recently, we passed uh, the Climate Crisis Response Policy, um, which that was a two year long um, uh, policy in the making um, and a very big one. Um, recently, Portland Mercury, I think, 
I believe, uh, called it one of the strongest climate policies in the nation for a school district to take. Um, and that's very big. Um, and so kind of, I, you know, listed um, how do we, you know, how do we get from, you know, one of the strongest policies in a, in a school district to uh, what it started out with our students and our children um, demanding climate justice, demanding bus passes. Uh, and that's kind of the process that the committee took was, you know, constantly meeting with our students, constantly meeting with climate advocates, constantly, you know, holding, making sure that our meetings are uh, virtual, which is something that a lot of committees um, started doing with Oregon law mandates is making sure things were virtual. Um, and the increased in participation that we got during uh, this, when our meetings were accessible to the public and all viewers could watch it, um, you know, taking the demands of community members, whether that be, you know, letters, marches, public testimony, and how do we take those vocal calls and actually turn that into solid pieces of legislation? Um, making sure our community members know what is happening. I know personally, I have always, if a committee meeting is happening, I use, you know, my Twitter, my Instagram, my Facebook, my whatever have you, TikTok, I don't know, um, and making sure that, you know, it's posted that people know that it's happening. A lot of times in, uh, I can't speak for every agency, but in public education, a lot of times parents have a hard time finding out um, what times things are happening. Our websites aren't always accessible. They're not always in multiple languages. Um, and so actively making sure that you are posting links and people know where to go. Uh, I'll, I'll often post the button, you know, where to find it on the website, what time it is. I give a day's notice and the day of that this committee meeting is happening. Um, and I often see more people engage and more younger people engage when we make sure that, you know, we ourselves are making sure that that platform is being used. I mean, we ourselves are taking it into our hands to make sure that our community members know what is happening. Um, yeah, and that's basically, that's basically my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, LP. And thank you, Maria, for including a little bit of my voice in today's panel. I really liked what LP offered um, in terms of some of the questions to ask yourself as you're creating a committee. I'm definitely going to be going back on that and critically thinking for myself um, because I have not only participated uh, on so many committees throughout my uh, career now in in public service and civic service here in Oregon, but also as a community organizer, I'm someone who typically thinks about ways to build outside power and ways to create things outside of our formalized systems with community as well. So I'll definitely be screenshotting that and taking notes. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Vivian Satterfield. Um, I currently work as the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Verde. Uh, we're based in the Cully neighborhood of Portland. But you know, I've also spent time uh, organizing with transit riders through Bus Riders Unite at Opal Environmental Justice Oregon. And before that, I worked in outer Southeast Portland um, in affordable housing as well. So you know, I've got a wide range of experiences um, throughout my 10 plus years now um, doing this type of work in Oregon, frequently actually being the youngest person in the room and identifying as a youth. Um, now I'm a bit older and frequently also wield a lot more power. And so I just kind of wanted to share some of the lessons that I've learned um, when it comes to committees um, and structures. So some of these lessons learned, you know, organizers and folks working on the outside, I'm really talking to you, um, but also these are lessons learned uh, for those who are inside, working inside uh, government um, and inside processes to think about how we may want to structure committees. One is that, you know, always utilize these committees as an opportunity to work on the inside with an outside lens. Don't be too navel gazing and really focusing on only what the committee's uh, goals may be or what the needs are coming out of that process because it must serve a larger purpose. You know, again, thinking back to some of the LP uh, questions that LP offered us, you know, what, why are you pulling folks together? What is the true purpose of that? And is there an opportunity for you to think about how you can leverage that space to work on the inside, build those relationships, get things on the record that you can utilize for outside that may be pulling a, a clip 
It may be pulling a quote and then utilizing social media to amplify and bring awareness to what that committee is doing um, and the sort of decisions are being made. Um, really be critical of the committee composition. If you're looking around and you're like, hey, there's some people missing here, that's an opportunity to, again, leverage power and really think about who needs to be brought into that conversation and who is being excluded as well. Again, a lot of this is about exercising powers within committees. Y'all, you can always say no. You don't have to say yes to every invitation that is coming to you to participate. Be critical of how you are spending and utilizing, and again, I think uh, LP uh, framed it really well, that capital T time. As Danny offered, a lot of these folks you know, are young people, people who are living their everyday lives. They may not be compensated or have um, opportunities to, uh, to spend a lot of their time on committees. So if you're being invited to a committee, you can always say no, and that can be a point of leverage as well. It also can be significant if there's a number of groups that you're working with together or individuals who um, perhaps your participation will, will, will lend credibility to that process. And if you're looking around and you're like, this is not serving our purpose, you can all collectively also organize to say, no, this is not working for us. We're not getting our needs met. Um, and again, use that for leverage. So always be critical about thinking about power, do your power mapping and, and really decide for yourself, Am I gonna say yes, or am I gonna say no? And who else needs to be with me in, in that chorus? And again, with all that, you know, don't be afraid to be propositional. If there's something that's not serving your needs, feel free to create your own process. Um, you know, we're doing that right now in the Cully neighborhood. Uh, we're creating a process to utilize this tool of tax increment financing. We're creating this external process we're doing it actually in a more power sharing model um, with the city's redevelopment agency um, and some of the other uh, agencies as well. But um, you know, this is an opportunity for us to really think about being propositional, creating the own process that, that serves our communities well, um, and bringing that in as an opportunity to uh, for government to really think about what they can learn from us, um, but also for us to kind of sharpen our expertise on how uh, we're pulling together these processes as well. So I just wanted to share some of those quick lessons learned, but always happy to talk more about um, what works and what doesn't afterwards. Thank you. Thanks you all for getting through all of your um, highlights. I know it's a quick session and we have a few moments to answer questions, but I'm gonna leave the committee commissions slide up there to see what folks have contributed. And I'm gonna ask you all, um, what can be better done to prepare underrepresented community participants to enter some of these like archaic and isolating spaces? Um, Danny, I'm gonna to point to you in saying how, how can some of these committee facilitators really help people be their best selves in the committee space, especially youth? Um, I would say, uh, being able to provide support. Um, a lot of the words, you know, I, going into public education, there are a lot of fancy words that we use when we talk about, you know, children in schools. I did not know what an FTE or a foundation <laughs> was two years ago. Um, and, you know, I had amazing staff who were able to, you know, a lot, you would be surprised how many people, when we talk about issues or we're making decisions, are too afraid to ask, what does that mean? That is something that I've started to come across of, is that a lot of times people are too afraid to ask, what does something mean? And, you know, I am not afraid to like constantly stop and be like, can you explain this? What does this mean? Okay, so give me the large picture of what we're talking about. Um, because sometimes not even like presenters, when they're presenting things to our committee, when we're talking about, you know, thousand dollar policies, understand what, um, what we're mean, how we're all looking at things. So that's one of the best things is constantly like how there are like um, just being able to like ask like, hey, what does this mean? You know, or hey, uh, can we pause and make sure that we're all collectively on the same page? Thank you. I think the turnaround time too for committee participants to prepare can be so short. Staffers give you a bunch of PDFs to read right before a meeting and it takes a long time to digest and process that information. 
think at, at the end of the day for many committee facilitators, they're frustrated that the, po the folks they've recruited aren't initially technical experts or that they're not well-versed in like the nonprofit industrial complex. So um, there's so many things people can do to, to better open up these spaces to be more inclusive and, and affirming of their knowledge and lived experiences. Um, let's go to, let's go to LP. Um, what's a weakness of committees that really needs to be addressed now? Um, you can speak from your Portland specific experience or just other things you've seen organizing with artists like across the country too. I think a big weakness is that some committees don't have like consistent goals um, that are like carried on or checked up on. Um, it's usually just that there's an agenda that's pre-made. You kind of get like halfway through each topic and then you move on and hope for the best for the next like meeting. And you let all this time muster up, but then also there's not enough money in the budget to like help committee members work in between the time and then you're also getting the people that like are on the ground that are constantly like wearing so many hats that like they can only offer the allotted time that the meeting is when in fact like some of the goals that have come up within the meeting are just like unrealistic and are going to take years um and there's just like this floating time and there's definitely no structure and I feel like this also causes like some like lack of like self-efficacy for myself sometimes because I'm like why am I coming to this meeting um okay beyond the money and beyond hanging out with like really rad people especially shout out to like Metro's equity advisory committee that's like definitely my favorite committee I'm not all anti-committee but yeah I think some committees are just like why am I meeting like what does it look like for a committee to continue working without meetings like what if you switch the meeting times to like work days um but yeah Thank you for asking, Marina. Great. Vivian, other ways you've seen um, that we have the opportunity to put power in people's hands beyond committees, or do we just keep on that trajectory and make sure that the committee makeup and the committee rules of engagement just transform altogether? Yeah, I think we're definitely have the opportunity to think more creatively about um, what we're trying to achieve with committees. Um, if it's just an advisory body, is there another way that we could be doing that more efficiently? Is that something that's more formalized, like a focus group? Is that something just like doing your outreach um, in a more compelling way within community? Um, or, you know, hosting a community event and then having the uh, question that you want to pose be integrated into that or be a part of that? Um, you know, I think that folks get involved in committees because they definitely want to learn more and, um, you know, be in community with their peers and then to influence the outcome of a decision. Um, and those are the ones that I have felt the most meaningful input of time into, not just being, thinking about the uh, experience on the committee itself, but what we were working towards. Um, but I do think that we can think more creatively about it and, you know, really partner with folks who are experts. Um, you know, organizing within communities and, uh, you know, working with young people, um, you know, working in culturally specific communities to really think about what are the processes that serve them best. So um, not everything has to be a committee. Thank you. Danny, you want to chime in on that one too? Other ways to put power in people's hands beyond committees? Yeah. Um... I'll give an example um, with the climate crisis response policy that Portland Public Schools passed this year. Um, is that really making, you know, the committee is a small group of people, but you know, this policy, for example, is every Portland Public School student. So it is okay to include more than just the com committee members' ideas. I tried to make sure, you know, even at my own school, I passed out flyers, I, you know, was that, you know, corner of the streets at school events being like, hey, hey, you know, trying to talk to as many teachers as I could. Um, you know, I connected with our teacher unions um, and, you know, collected 40 plus emails of different output that I pit. So when I could come back to the committee and, you know, it would, I would hear, oh, this is what the community wants. I could be like, 
well, I talked to 40 plus, you know, teachers and they say the exact opposite. Um, or, you know, I have uh, collecting a list from students and, you know, climate, you know, our students are wanting to see this. So really, in my opinion, like how much, imp the more input you can get from the community and put it back into your committee is the most power that you're going to see. Thank you. LP, if you want to add one more thing, you're going to pass. All right. Okay, we'll, we'll start to queue up Elliot if you can get ready. But I appreciate everybody talking about committees today is really just a quick preview of some of the things that are on our minds. I've been serving on the Portland Clean Energy Fund Committee and it's been the honor of my life. Um, also like incredibly challenging for people to be put in, in these really big spaces and spotlights and, and to sometimes take, take a lot of responsibility for decisions more than like other folks who have way more power over those decisions. So it's been a good lesson and, and thing to experience these past few years, but it, it shows you that you can put power into community members' hands and that they can continue to redistribute resources and powers in ways that haven't been possible. And that's a big shout out to Portland voters for wanting to establish something like the Portland Clean Energy Fund and the committee structure to help with grant making that's been unprecedented elsewhere for programs like these. If you have any other questions for the panelists, please reach out to us. LP, Danny, and Vivian are, are always around, and so am I. Um, I'm no longer working in an Oregon-specific organization, but with the Safe Routes Partnership, I'm certainly reachable and would love to strategize and organize with people around the bipartisan infrastructure law. So if you're thinking about putting a committee together or revamping one of yours, come talk to us, talk to all of us. We've certainly got ideas for that. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Maria, Lillian, Danny, and Vivian. Uh, now it's time for our second uh, presentation from this morning's session, um, Backing into the Future, Planning for a Post-COVID Transportation System. So please welcome to your screens, Elliot Rose. Oh, there we go. Pardon my own beauty for just a little bit. I'm glad uh, you all can see that this is happening without any special effects here over on my end. And we're still very much in the world of Zoom foibles that we've been inhabiting for this past couple of years. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much uh, to our Maria and team for that presentation. That was great. Metro does convene a lot of committees. Uh, my notes and with not everything has to be a committee in all caps. Uh, and I think that's really good words for us to, to sit on as public agencies in the region. Um, <clears throat> I'm Elliot Rose. I'm a transportation planner at Metro. And I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing um, <clears throat> to uh, try to understand some of the behavior changes that we've seen uh, through the pandemic and these incredibly disruptive past few years and how we're accounting for that in our planning moving forward. Um, but the title of this presentation is a little bit of a flip. It's called Backing into the Future. Um, but I feel like our long-term plans are often a reflection of our recent history. Um, you know, when we're in a boom time in the economy, we kind of assume that we'll be in a boom time uh, over the next 20 years. And when we're in a depression, we do the same thing, uh, you know, assume that same thing into the future. And now is more important than ever before to actually look back and really think carefully about how people, how different types of people's behavior change and what might stick so that we can make sure we're planning for the transportation system that's actually in our future instead of uh, the future that we thought we were gonna experience a decade ago. So I'm talking about today about a piece of work Metro has been doing called the Emerging Transportation Trends Study. Um, I think I just talked pretty well about what it's about. Um, I did wanna talk about what we're going to do with that study though. So Metro is the regional planning agency for the greater Portland area. Um, and when it comes to transportation planning, a lot of what we do is coordinating projects and investments that take regional collaboration across multiple jurisdictions. So, you know, whenever a new light rail line or major, uh, you know, transportation corridors being updated and it crosses city limits, 
um, Metro steps in to help make sure that everyone is coordinated and that there are enough resources to finish the project in a way that meets everyone's needs. <clears throat> um, a really important document for us in doing that is called the Regional Transportation Plan that looks at how we're going to use the resources that we have to uh, identify a set of projects that can meet the needs we expect, the transportation needs we expect to see in the region over the next 20 years. And this is a document we're required to keep by the federal government and update every five years. <clears throat> so as we're heading into the next update of the regional transportation plan, this study is going to help us uh, help guide our analysis and make sure that we're responding to how people are actually traveling these days and also help guide our policies and make sure that the policy decisions that we're making through that plan are relevant to people's changing needs. <clears throat> So actually, before I get into the <clears throat> my data, I think, you know, this is a big study that has some really wide ranging work. <clears throat> and, you know, I get a lot of benefit out of just talking about this work to people. I think we've all lived through some very crazy times, very individualistically. And <clears throat> it's really hard to build a sense of collective experience about that, which is honestly the first thing that we often need to do <clears throat> um, in order to make you know, good collaborative decisions as a public. And so <clears throat> I get, I'm just, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm going to share with you some findings from the study as it's developing. I'm going to try to share, focus on how they reflect on active transportation. It's going to open up for conversation or consideration about, you know, how you see these findings or, you know, how it might affect some of the other things you've been thinking about as you've worked your way through the summer. <clears throat> I want to, before we get into some big rich data and charts, I want to take a moment to frame up um, how I see equity in this work, because <clears throat> um, the data is complex and the importance of equity issues is not always easy to see. <clears throat> so I want to frame it up front. <clears throat> so this pandemic has widened a lot of the pre-existing inequities that we were struggling with as a region, not just transportation, health, employment, and education. <clears throat> For BIPOC, and low-income people, as well as for others, uh, women, service workers, older people, older adults have all faced inequities through this pandemic. <clears throat> and some of those, many of those issues are bigger than just transportation alone, but they lend new urgency to the transportation equity work that's happening in the region. Another big thing that's happening is that affluent, we talk, we talk about a lot of adaptations and changes like teleworking or online shopping, and people are very preoccupied with understanding how those things are changing now. But it's largely affluent people who have had the time and resources to adapt in that way. <clears throat> um, meanwhile, a lot of BIPOC and low-income people have continued to travel in the same ways that they have, and that's limited their access to opportunities. <clears throat> um, we also see increased concerns about racism, policing, and personal safety uh, <clears throat> due to racism against uh, Asian immigrants, uh, over the fact that the pandemic originated in China or uh, concerns about racism and policing post George Floyd, these, these concerns are really shaping how safe people feel in public, which is something that we know, but is not always apparent in the data. And then you're gonna hear me talking about transit uh, today because transit is really struggling right now across the nation. And though transit agencies have been prioritizing equity and we're responding to the pandemic, it's just been a really public challenging time for a mode that many people rely on and a mode that's really critical to supporting active transportation as well and providing a complete set of options for people to live a car-free lifestyle. <clears throat> so I'm sorry that these uh, notifications keep popping up on my screen. <clears throat> I hope they're not uh, interfering too much with the slides. So <clears throat> we've all heard that people stop traveling during the pandemic, but I want to nuance that a little bit and show how it had affected different modes and different types of routes. So you see in April 2020, all forms of travel went down. Uh, <clears throat> this is showing different types of road traffic on different types of roadways, as well as ridership on different types of transit, all normalized to February 2020. So February 2020 is 100% wherever ridership or volumes were at relative to 2020 is what you're seeing in this chart. <clears throat> and um, what you see is that transit fell off much more dramatically than driving and has recovered much less quickly. 
This isn't updated with the most recent data. I believe we're back up above 50% of where transit ridership was in the region uh, at this point, but still got a long way to go to get back up to 100%. Also, you know, even on driving, a lot of the story you've heard is that people had stopped driving and then they came back to it. But it looks really differently when you look at start to look at different types of roads. <clears throat> um, and I don't have as good of data for some roads as I have as others. But as far as I can tell, on freight routes, traffic really came back immediately after the pandemic kind of set in because people never stopped buying stuff. <clears throat> um, highway travel. Uh, has gone up and down. It's it's still right now around 5% below where it was uh, pre-pandemic in many roadways in our region. But you know, it's it's back closer to normal levels. Arterial traffic last time we checked um, is was down significantly below highway traffic was where highway traffic was. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute because arterials are where people walk and bike, they're where people take transit, they're where the land uses that people want to go to are. So uh, we've been very curious to have a better picture about what's happening there. But, you know, really just overall, there's been like a nuance, there's been a nuanced kind of way in which this pandemic has hit different modes. <clears throat> when we think into our future of the region, um, we look, <clears throat> we, we see some concern about making sure that the transit system can continue to serve as the backbone of our transportation system. <clears throat> um, you know, what we're seeing prior to the pandemic is that, uh, you know, transits, there were, there were some significant investments being put into transit service, but ridership was falling. And then during the pandemic, it really plummeted. And right now we're seeing in the national data, people reporting a lot of aversion about still, abort, uh, still returning to transit over lingering health and safety concerns. <clears throat> and so what that suggests to us is that, you know, this, this is showing what would happen if those national trends continued and if we continued our current level of transit investment into the future. And what I'm seeing here is that even if we invest in transit service as we were planning to before the pandemic hit, ridership is gonna lag service and, we're not, and we may not get back up to the pre-pandemic levels of ridership for quite a while. And so this chart to me suggests that we need significant investment, increase, increase investment in transit that's reflective of the way people are riding today in order to have the transportation system we want to see. <clears throat> since this is the act of trans since this is the act of transportation summit, I also want to share some data about biking. <clears throat> um, so in the Portland region, as in a lot of other regions, um, we saw recreational bike trips significantly increase at the start of the pandemic. This is showing Strava data, which people, which is an app that people mainly use to track recreational bike rides. There's a lot of reason why this data isn't perfect, but it's some of the better data that we have on recreational trips. And what you see is that, you know, recreational bike trips, as far as we can tell in this data, double uh, in spring 2020. And then as we head into fall um, 2020, they're still higher than they were in fall 2019 that gap has started to, to shrink a little bit, but we think that there are some opportunities. We, do, we think that there may be you know, a, a boost for recreational cycling that's, that, that continues into the future because so many more people hopped on a bike and tried that during the pandemic. <clears throat> um, there are a lot of other things that are going on that are, I think, influencing how people feel walking and biking right now and that can help us understand what, to, what we might expect from walking and biking in the future. Um, one unfortunate thing to report is that tra our streets really became less safe during the pandemic. Traffic deaths rode, rose 7.2%. If you factor in the fact that people were driving less during the pandemic, actually they rise at pretty staggering 22% per mile driven. And we think we know why that is. It's because people were speeding more in empty streets and because people were driving under the influence more. Looking into the future, maybe the streets won't be as empty and maybe the speeding won't go away, but maybe some of the habits and the stresses that are contributing to driving under the influence could stick around and could keep our streets less safe than they were before for a considerable amount of time into the future. Um, on the more optimistic side, we also have, we saw bicycle sales growing by a pretty staggering 67% between 2019 and 2021, and e-bike sales uh, grew by 240% over that same period because e-bikes are getting so much more affordable 
and so much more useful as the range and range increases and the cost of batteries go down. I wanted to compare that to electric vehicles, which also outperformed expectations during the pandemic because again, batteries are getting cheaper and more efficient. But you know, they stayed flat while gas powered vehicle sales fell. We didn't see the same dramatic growth in EV sales that we saw in e-bike sales. And clearly there's just something special going on in the e-bike sector uh, right now that presents an opportunity for transportation planning to think about. <clears throat> um, I also, I'm gonna switch to talking about teleworking now. <clears throat> um, this chart is showing uh, how many people worked at home before the pandemic. That's this orange line, this is national data. And then it's showing by income, how many people work from home during the pandemic. Those are these dark blue bars. And how many people said that they would risk, basically they had to choose between their health and their job during the pandemic. <clears throat> so, and this is broken out by income quintiles, the bottom quintile over here and the top earners over here. So in any income category you're looking at, the, num the amount of people working from home jumps significantly by at least around fourfold. But the jump is much more significant for higher income workers. <clears throat> and meanwhile, lower income workers are much more likely to report that they face a choice between staying home and staying healthy and keeping the jobs. So <clears throat> there's an equity story here where, yes, people are working from home now. Not everyone may have access to that. <clears throat> we think working from home will continue into the future. Um, Oregon was already a pretty high telework state before the pandemic. Uh, we consistently in the Portland region have teleworking rates were, you know, a couple percentage points above the national average of around 5%. Um, we think that will continue to increase over time, but there's going to be a little bit of a rebound in the short term as people return to work from this pandemic peak. And then as, age, as, as, as organizations adapt in the long term, the numbers will start to rise. Be quite a variation. That's what this range is showing. And how much people are teleworking into the future <clears throat> and low-income people are probably going to be teleworking less because of what I just described. <clears throat> but even under the lowest scenario in our projections, you know, we're basically we we have uh, we have significant growth in teleworking um, that really kind of amounts to almost to adding a new transit system to our region in terms of how many people are now uh, commuting by teleworking. As far as how this affects travel behavior, though, that's a really interesting picture. What we've seen from data emerging from other cities is that um, telework people, you know, teleworkers seem to be traveling less during rush hour and making up with that by traveling more for errands throughout the day. <clears throat> so, you know, these charts all show in different major U.S. cities um, what traffic throughout the day looked like before the pandemic. These are the yellow lines and then what it looked like during the pandemic. And you can see, you know, there's less traffic during, particularly the morning peak in a lot of cities and more traffic throughout the day. It seems like from what we're hearing, this traffic is also more likely to be on local streets because it's people running neighborhood, running errands in their neighborhood as they pick up groceries or pick up their kids from school in the middle of the workday. <clears throat> and so, you know, um, we're seeing some reductions of the peak trips that really drove a lot of congestion in the region, region. That creates an opportunity. At the same time, I mentioned earlier, we want to understand what's going on arterials. And it's partially because we want to make, we want to see if this phenomenon is creating more traffic on arterials and local streets that might create more safety conflicts for people biking and walking throughout the day. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to sum it all up now and turn over to this conversation. So what we found overall, and I didn't go through all the trends that we studied. I'm happy to share more information if you want. And, uh, you know, Maddie, let me know if my contact information isn't available through the program. And I can also make sure I can also uh, drop it in the chat for people who want to follow up. <clears throat> um, what we're finding, though, is that the individual trends that we're studying, like teleworking, like the transit systems recovery, <clears throat> um, like shopping online, which I didn't cover too much, they all have different impacts, but collectively, they pose some pretty significant challenges to meeting the region's climate safety and equity goals. 
particularly because of how slow people are returning to the transit system, which is central to meeting those goals. <clears throat> um, we also know that we're focused on these changes, but these changes, you know, a lot of the travel behavior changes we're seeing are things that privileged people are able to do and things that low-income people and BIPOC people may not be able to do. And so the ongoing equity impacts of the pandemic depend on, you know, to a certain extent, how much we assume these new behaviors are normal moving forward, or we really try to think about how to encourage access to opportunities for all people in this new environment. Some of the questions that this raises for me, I, honestly, like looking at this stuff, you know, I, I it's really spark, sparks my curiosity and uh, <laughs> there's a lot more I want to know. I mentioned that we really want to know how travels changed on arterial streets so we can have a better picture of how multimodal transit and safety has been impacted by uh, these new travel patterns you're seeing. Um, both Metro and a lot of our transit agencies are looking at how to redesign the transit network around how people are now traveling. TriMet has is updating its service plan through an effort called Forward Together um, that you can find out more about more on about TriMet's website right now. There are a lot of workshops going on through that. <clears throat> um, also curious about how we fund the transit system we need in the region over the long term. Um, what I shared about e-bikes really raises a question to me whether e-bikes can help meet Oregon's transportation electrification targets. Right now, those targets are really focused on vehicles, but I think particularly in metro regions like this one, we have the opportunity to really uh, jumpstart toward those by also looking at using electric, electric bikes to replace trips and gas-powered vehicles. And lastly, we're also wondering, you know, does digital access now play a stronger role in connecting people to education and job opportunities? And if so, what are transportation agencies' roles investing on that? Those are some of the questions we're considering as we head into this RTP update. We'll be reporting back on our final findings from this study um, in June to Metro Council, um, as well as JPAC, and those are public meetings that you can find out about on the Metro calendar as well. With that, I'd love to turn it over to see if we have any questions. Elliot, there was one question in the chat. Um, if the work from home data is uh, national, regional, or Portland only? Thank you so much. Yeah, great question. Um, so the the data, I'm gonna, I showed a couple different pieces of work from home data. Um, this is national data. The data I showed by income. This data, um, but again, sorry, the notifications are blocking these titles. This is based on state of Oregon data. Um, <clears throat> the historical data shown here up to 2020 is actual, you know, is actual data from the state of Oregon. And then as we get into the pandemic, our consultants are doing some projections to bring that data down to the regional level. <clears throat> um, and another question from the chat, or are you reading it yourself? I did see that, yeah. Okay. Thanks for asking, Hi, Kathy. So um, we, will, we do have resources from the presentations that have been, uh, get, that, that have been given today, all the presentations and reports uh, I'm happy to share with you. Um, you can contact me about that. Um, also, one of the things I'm really excited about um, is, you know, a lot of that information currently is kind of in white paper and PowerPoint form. <clears throat> As we do, our part of our final deliverables is to prepare a set of fact sheets that really bring together this information in, you know, good, relatable, narrative ways so that it's not just such a uh, soup of data <laughs> like I just showed. And so uh, when, when, you, when, the, when, our, you know, when we're going before Metro Bodies in June, those, those fact sheets will be accept accessible. Pause and see if we have any other questions. If not, Maddie, happy to turn it back over to you. Um, thanks everyone for the listening and feedback today. And uh, I'll, I'll drop my I'll drop my email in the chat in case folks want to follow up with me on this. There is one more question okay. in the chat. How are you addressing factors like skyrocketing housing prices, land use into the RTP? That is a really great question. So 
the RTP, um, <laughs> the RTP is a transportation plan, um, but it relies on a land use forecast. Um, the first thing that we try to do is try to make our land use forecast more reflective <laughs> of those, uh, <clears throat> you know, of how people are actually buying housing and who's able to buy housing and where. Um, so that, you know, when we are analyzing the RTP, we use a computer travel model to see how people actually travel within the system as it grows and changes over the years. We have realistic assumptions about affordability. <clears throat> That's the base. Then <clears throat> our policymakers have asked whether housing affordability should be a greater uh, focus of the, of the RTP and whether it should include policies to, that focus on uh, coordinating housing affordability and transportation affordability, how it can be effective in doing that given that it's a transportation plan and what it can and can't say about the transportation system is you know, pretty governed by a lot of state and federal law. <clears throat> um, we're gonna have a conversation about that with our policymakers uh, in, in the coming months. I don't have an exact date for that, but it, I believe it should be over the summer. And I think that'll be a question that the that Metro Council and JPAC will be grappling with. Post RTP, we do have a big land use vision for the region that is really in need of updating. Um, and so we are going to be updating this land use vision. Um, that's Metro's regional regional growth concept. And that will take a deep look at housing affordability and really actually look at designing the region to prioritize investments in the places where we need to maintain aff affordability. Um, just unfortunately, because of the timeline that we're on for this RTP, where we need to complete it by the end of 2023 in order to keep certain transportation funds coming to the region, um, we need to prioritize the transportation, the transportation look before we get to that bigger picture land use look. Um, <clears throat> wow. And Zeph just asked an amazing question. <clears throat> um, I think, I think, I, 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 uh, I don't have the answers to all of these questions, Zeph, but I can tell you what I've learned or what I've seen in the data. <clears throat> so, um, you know, a lot of the information that I, I've talked a lot with the real estate brokers that we work with at Metro to acquire property near transit. Um, we were relying for advice about, you know, about the property market. Um, <clears throat> their general, uh, it, what, what I heard from them last time I checked in with them is that, you know, they do think that, uh, that office uses will come back to, you know, will come back to downtown and that those will fuel a lot of the other service, like you know, the return of a lot of the other uh, service type of businesses that we've seen in downtown. <clears throat> um, on the other end of the spectrum, I'm also looking, uh, Inrix put out a really interesting report um, on travel patterns in American cities. And, <clears throat> you know, in this data, that data showed that down trips to downtown Portland have fallen off more than in most other major metros. Um, <clears throat> So I think the jury, the, the jury is still very much out on that. Um, and I think that you're noticing that planners are sometimes split on that. And I think that's because the evidence is also that I'm seeing is also split on that. And, you know, I just hope to keep putting that out there and keep being honest about that so that we can have this conversation and get to hopefully get closer, hopefully to the truth of what we should be doing. I'll respond to that last question in the chat. Maddie, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to, uh, to move us on to the next session. Meanwhile. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, all of our presenters this mor morning, Maria, Lillian, Danny, Vivian, and Elliot. Um, thanks to our presenting sponsor, Metro. Thanks to all our other sponsors who are listed on our conference website. And thanks to all of you for coming to uh, the second day opening session. As you exit Zoom, you'll be presented with an anonymous survey. We appreciate your feedback. Um, please do enjoy the rest of the summit. And I wanna let you know about our uh, in-person events this afternoon. 
um, at 4 p.m. is the Afro Village Home Base, how retired Max train cars will help advance equity and sustainability in Portland's black and brown communities. That is at the Providence Park Max Station, rain or shine. Um, and in the spirit of Taco Tuesday, they are going to be hosting a happy hour style workshop uh, with a few interactives for all the guests there. You can hang out in the train uh, so you won't get rained on if it is rainy at that part of the day. Um, network and learn about the future of the Afro Village home base movement. Uh, go to thestreettrust.org slash RSVP to RSVP to that. Um, or any of our other in-person events. That's a good way to see all the in-person events listed together. Also at four is the Greenways Bike Tour. That meets at Salmon Street Fountain. We'll join PBOT Bicycle Coordinator Roger Geller for a tour of Portland Greenways, new and old. Uh, it's gonna be about 15 miles uh, ending at drinks. Um, and then later at 5 p.m. is the Safe Routes to School Networking Happy Hour at the Ron Tom's Patio. Um, and that